good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Ramez Nam's session, The Edge of Exponential Technologies. Ramez joins us from the Singularity University in the US, and uh, we're lucky to have him here celebrating Amplify last week in Melbourne. Uh, so welcome to Sydney, Ramesh, uh, Ramez. Welcome to, to AMP. Um, before I get started, a special uh, welcome to visitors to AMP. There's many in the crowd today. Um, there'll be many people in the crowd that have returned amplifiers, have been to amplify on previous occasions. Um, of course, there's a number of directors of AMP here in the audience today, and of course, employees. So welcome. Um, and thank you for contributing to Amplify in such a visual manner. Um, and we look forward to your contributions, not only today, but the rest of the week. Um, my name's Justin Ward. I'm head of reinsurance and strategic projects in the insurance business at AMP, and I'll be the host for today's session. Um, so a little bit, a bit about today's session. Um, we'll get started in a few moments with um, Ramez being welcomed by Richard Earl. Uh, the founder and executive chairman of Talent. Um, so he'll introduce the session, um, introduce Ramez, um, and then following Richard's introductions, uh, Ramez will speak for 20 to 25 minutes. When we're finished, I'll be facilitating a conversation uh, with you, the audience. Um, we also have many people online uh, watching the session. They'll be able to participate through a zingle, um, and I'll be chairing that session and, and taking questions uh, from the crowd as well. So when you're willing to participate and, and ask a question, I just ask that you um, call for the microphone, um, state your name, uh, where you're from, um, and encourage you, if you have context around that question, to go to the question in the first instance and then come to the context later. It's often answer, easier to answer in that, uh, in that manner. Um, as I said, the stream is being, oh, sorry, the session is being live streamed um, to others in AMP offices and across the world. Um, those individuals will be able to submit questions uh, via Zedings. Um, and then towards the end of the session, uh, there will be a, a feedback form or a quick survey to fill, and I'll aim to have you out of here so we can prepare for our next session uh, by 10.50. Before I ask Richard to uh, reju uh, introduce Ramez, um, just a couple of comments on, on talent. Um, so Richard, as I said, is the executive chairman and founder of Talent. Uh, he found, founded Talent in a garage in Perth, um, my hometown in the mid-1990s. Uh, today, it's a company that turns over uh, just over $400 million and supplies thousands of contract and permanent technology specialists across the globe. Um, obviously a company that's achieved outstanding growth over the past 20 years um, and is the largest independently owned and operated recruitment business in Australia. Um, Talent have really made a break from the pack, um, as they call it, and are in the process of building a truly unique global IT technology and digital recruitment specialist practice um, that will provide unparalleled level of service and care for candidates and our clients. Um, without saying anything else, I'd like to ask Richard uh, to the stage. Uh, Richard, of course, will reduce, uh, introduce Ramez, and, um, and then we can start Ramez's session. Thanks very much, Richard. Yeah, th thanks for the uh, introduction. Um, Thanks to uh, AMP for allowing us to be part of this uh, amazing gathering and you know, I congratulate you on, on promoting innovation. It's, it's essential. I think uh, you know, um, Australia uh, has so much potential, so much infrastructure to, to do more and I think we've got to do it. And um, you know, uh, uh, at Talent we talk about taking the customer to the impossible place which is a level of service not thought imaginable and I think um, you know, we're certainly punning the future on creating a value that previously didn't exist. And, um, and I think with the technology available, um, that's what all organisations have got to do. I think Craig talked about reducing margins. Every industry has got challenges. So it, it's about those who are bold enough to reinvent themselves. And certainly, uh, you know, we're trying some interesting things there. But so 
Today's uh, speaker, uh, Ramez, is, uh, speaks my language. Uh, he talks about uh, exponential growth uh, and change out there. There's a lot of projections about how uh, tomorrow will be unrecognizable. I think um, I hear projections that 70% of tomorrow's jobs have yet to be invented. Um, there will be change, that's without doubt. I, I think our education system has to change before we're going to see it too soon, but there will be change, no question about it. So, um, so delighted to be able to introduce uh, Ramez Nam, who's come all the way from Silicon Valley. I think we're crossing over. I'm heading there on Wednesday where we're doing some interesting things there. So, um, so I welcome on stage Ramez to talk about uh, the exponential change we're, we're all going to experience. And uh, welcome, Ramez. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Richard, and thank you, Justin. And it's an honor to be here today with you and to follow Craig and Craig. So we're just going to dive right into it. Uh, you've heard a bit about me. I'm a technology person. I spent 13 years in tech, and I'm a co-chair for energy and environment at a place called Singularity University, where we talk about using exponential technologies, the technologies that are doubling in price performance every few years to address some of the greatest challenges of humanity globally, as well as to accelerate the pace of progress in business. I'm the author of five books, uh, most well known for being the author of science fiction novels. And being a science fiction author is quite interesting, because many people think that when you're writing science fiction, your job or your goal is to predict the future. And this is absolutely not the case. Or if it is the case, then science fiction is a gigantic failure. Because we actually don't predict it very well. It surprises all of us. But what we are good at is we're good at provoking thoughts about the future. Let me give you an example of, of why we need to just not predict, but provoke. You might think if you were in the 1950s and you were a science fiction author, you saw the rise of the automobile, and then you saw the rise of the movie theater. And you'd say, wow, a great linear combination of those is I'm going to predict the rise of the drive-in movie theater. Excellent. Well done. But very few would have taken this a step further and predicted a uh, sexual revolution. And that's what I mean by provoke, and that's what I mean by the surprise that the future has for us. So with that in mind, I'm going to try to get provocative about where these technologies, AI, robotics, nanotech, and so on, could go. And I will say that we see some patterns. We see in industry after industry, a domain gets digitized. It goes from an analog process to a digital one. And then it becomes dematerialized. And assets, physical assets especially, matter less. And then it becomes demonetized. And the price of the service or product goes down, which is amazing for consumers and sort of scary for producers. And then finally, it becomes democratized. And technology or capabilities that once only the global elite had become the domain of billions of people around the world. So let's get into an example of that. How many of you have driven in a self-driving car? We have a few. I highly recommend it. If you can get to Silicon Valley, see if you can somehow arrange to get one of these, or wait a few years, and you will. These vehicles are amazing. They've driven 2 million kilometers on US roads with 16 accidents, uh, 15 of them caused by humans. Right? So they are far better drivers than any human being. That's partially because they can see the world in ways that we can't see. They use something called LIDAR, a laser version of radar, if you will. And because they have the ability to process that data and respond in microseconds to stimuli that it would have taken you or I seconds to respond to. So I want to give you a visceral idea of what it's like to ride in a self-driving vehicle. I'm going to show you a short video, and I apologize in advance. There might be a tiny bit of profanity. The Hans team will never believe this. Oh thing. my goodness. Go is the right word. Holy shit. Jesus. Holy shit. There's no fucking hands on that wheel. Oh my god. <laughs> what? It's driving itself. Ah! Ah! <laughs> that is often our response to the future. Right. Now, I'll be honest, the way that it's actually like to drive in a self-driving car is nothing like that. It drives very carefully. It always obeys the law. Uh, it's very cautious, unless you turn the dials a little bit, you know, a developer on the team, then you get that sort of ride. 
But we might think uh, self-driving cars mean, great, there's going to be an AI behind the steering wheel, a robot steering it like that. That happened in an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, I think. But in fact, the digitization is domain opens up the possibility of changing what an automobile is like and changing what it's used for. Because if the vehicle is going to drive itself, then this could become an environment for work, for entertainment, for sleep, for socialization, for whatever it is that you want. And that fundamentally changes it. Right? So we see throughout history what looks like a sudden explosion. For thousands of years, very little happens. Or what does happen is important, but happens on a slow pace. And then suddenly, the Industrial Revolution happens, and progress takes off. And in fact, if we flattened this curve, you'd say the internet arrives, and it takes off again. But that's on a linear view. What's actually happening is that there's a steady exponential pace of progress. And an exponential is quite different. You all, you work in finance, you understand compound interest, right? We always underestimate intuitively the long-term impact. So if I take 30 linear steps, each step one meter long, I get to the next room or so. But if every step is doubling, one meter, two meter, four meters, eight meters, instead of 30 meters, I go a billion meters. And I go 26 times around the Earth. So we tend to overestimate the pace of change in the short term and underestimate vastly the pace of change in the long term. When a new exponential technology arrives, let's say it's AI, or let's say it's a 3D printer, at first it's quite disappointing. There's hype. You say, oh, this is amazing. And you find out that the 3D printer can only print in plastic, and it can only print one widget per 10 days. But then it's two widgets, then it's four, then it's eight, then it's 1,000 widgets per 10 days. And then shortly after that, it's 100,000 widgets per 10 days. Because it's doubling in its performance every few months or few years. And then you go from surprise. Wow, we never saw this coming. Suddenly, we're amazed by how good this technology is. And this has happened in domain after domain after domain. And we don't really do well at predicting this sort of exponential change. We have uh, status quo bias, or the curse of knowledge. This is Vinod Kosla, founder of Sun Microsystems. He took data about how fast mobile phones grew around the world and compared it to the consensus projections of the world's leading telephony experts. Those projections are the more or less straight lines going off to the right. And the actual growth was exponential, not linear. The world's leading experts in a domain will almost always tell you that it's going to go more slowly than it really is, especially in the long term. Most of this is because of Moore's Law. Who here knows what Moore's Law is? You absolutely should. If your business is touched by technology, and your business is definitely touched by technology, you need to know this. Moore's Law is the doubling of the amount of computing you can buy per dollar every 18 months or so. Doubling is great, but to play that out, 10 years, you get 100 times more computing per dollar. Every 20 years, you get 10,000 times more computing per dollar. Every 30 years, you get a million times more computing per dollar and bandwidth and storage. That's not a future prediction. That's an observation of what's happened throughout history. Put it more simply. I went to University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. That's ILLIAC, one of the world's first digital computers. On the left is a smartphone. This smartphone is millions of times more powerful than ILLIAC. In fact, if we tried to build something with as much power as my smartphone using ILLIAC technology, it would have a footprint larger than Sydney, it would be kilometers tall, and it would consume all the electricity of Australia. And it still couldn't play Angry Birds or Snapchat. There'd be no one to Snapchat too, because world GDP could build exactly one of these things. The cost of computing goes to zero. The cost of storage goes to zero. The cost of bandwidth goes to zero. Google challenges their engineers. What could you do if computing was free? And that's how they think of what's going to be a good product five or 10 years from now. So we see this happening. This is Mark Andreessen. Mark founded the company Netscape, built the first public uh, web browser. And he says software is eating the world, that in business after business, computing is doing what physical assets or human labor used to do. And we see it. So this is uh, IBM Watson, an AI investment by IBM. We conquered chess with computers decades ago. But IBM said, let's go after a harder game, go after an unstructured game like Jeopardy. So they took Watson to play Jeopardy, and it won. And it didn't just beat two clever humans. It beat the two-time most winningest human champions of history. And it trounced them. It took them to the cleaners. And that's two years ago. It's four times more powerful now. Now, that's a hard game. An even harder game than that is Go. 
Go is like chess squared in difficulty. Every move in a Go game is as complex for a computer as an entire chess game. But Google used a new AI technology called machine learning to teach a computer to intuitively look at a Go board and say, is this a good situation or not? And with that, they defeated this guy, Lee Sedol, the world champion Go player. And you see he's physically taken aback by some of these moves. It doesn't play like a human. It plays in ways that just shock and surprise him, actually. Now, it's one business model to win international Go games or uh, Jeopardy games. It's very limited as a business model. But there's other sectors that are gigantic, that are amenable to the use of AI. Healthcare. $4 trillion global business. And now when we look at healthcare diagnostics, if you have a CAT scan, an MRI, blood tests, in almost all of those cases, algorithms either outperform human doctors now or are on the verge of doing so in the next few years. What does that do to healthcare? What does that disrupt? And who does that help? Billions of people, potentially. Right? And in fact, just uh, last month, the XPRIZE $10 million Qualcomm Tricorder prize, inspired by Star Trek, was won by a team that can use a mobile device to take five vital readings and diagnose 10 different diseases with a mobile device costing less than $1,000. That's the kind of innovation that we're having now. Or drones. Uh, these went from being something that only the US military could afford to being something that you might get your kids for Christmas. Right? They plunged in price. And the number one reason they plunged in price was that computing got cheaper. And so it became easier to handle balancing these four different rotors, adjusting the wind gusts, and so on. And that changes the world. In disaster areas like Haiti, the roads are washed out. In much of India, Sub-Saharan Africa, there simply are no roads. But these devices can get to places. This is a company came out of Singularity University. Uh, Matterport using drones to deliver emergency supplies, medicines and blood supplies in Haiti after the earthquake there a few years ago. That's disrupting supply chains. This company now has a $700 million deal with Daimler-Benz to integrate this with delivery vans. That's what's happening in the world. Or this, space. We're talking about the edge of the possible, the exponential edge. What is more uh, the edge than space. Now, you'd think that space is a very hard physical uh, sector that couldn't possibly be disrupted by software, but it has been. This vehicle, this is a SpaceX launch, it costs about a, close to $100 million per launch. The cost of the fuel is about $100,000 per launch. All right? So if you could reuse the vehicle, most of the cost is that you throw away the vehicle every time. If you can reuse the vehicle, you can cut the cost of launch by a factor of 10, 100, maybe more. Why is SpaceX able to land these drones on their tail? How could you possibly land a rocket ship on its tail like that? Why are they able to do that? Because of software. Because computing has made this possible. And in fact, Moore's laws affected space in other ways. Satellites that used to require 1,000 kilos of electronics are now launching these CubeSats. A CubeSat weighs 1.3 kilos. Right? And in fact, they're so popular now that on the ISS, this is an actual photo, there's a dedicated launcher to launch CubeSats. These are called 2U CubeSats. They're two uh, stuck together, 2.6 uh, kilos. But that's what it used to take 1,000 kilos to do. So in two ways, we're shrinking the cost of launch per kilo, and we're shrinking the payload that you need. Space suddenly is being eaten by Moore's Law. Right. Or manufacturing, I talked about 3D printing, and 3D printing has been around for decades actually, but it wasn't very good. Now recently, we've had uh, better and better 3D printers that work in plastic, and in fact we have some that are speeding up the process by a factor of 10, 100, or 1,000. And it's amazing for prototyping. If your design team is working on some physical object, instead of having to get tooling done, have something made in China by injection molding, you can just do it overnight or in a few hours in your office. But of course, that's just prototyping. That's not a production object, right? Well, that has changed, too. Now we have laser metal sintering devices. And uh, large companies of all sorts, automotive, aerospace, Boeing, Airbus, use these devices in their production lines, not just to prototype, but to build actual parts. Because they can build shapes that they could not build by any other method. They can have lighter objects with better designs, uh, and that can increase their performance. GE's uh, newest turboprop engine cut its part count from 500 parts to 150 parts, increased its operating temperature 
temperature and increased its thrust to weight ratio of about 30%, a gigantic improvement by 3D printing more and more of these parts. And so you see all sorts of shapes here. This is an uh, injection nozzle for an engine, the tiniest shapes you can imagine, customized high fashion to SpaceX again. So not only does SpaceX use software, they 3D print two-thirds of their engine. Two-thirds of the part count for their engine is 3D printed in titanium nickel alloy because they can get better shapes and just better performance, as well as being able to iterate on the shape literally every day. They don't have a 10-week wait to get a new engine made. They'll say, oh, let's change the nozzle a bit like this. Tomorrow, we'll test it. That was impossible before. Robotics. Robotics used to only work when you had highly ordered situations. Now they can take chaos and turn it into order. This is a simple packaging robot. We used to have to have uh, complex and rigid programming. That's changed. This is Baxter. You don't program Baxter. You teach Baxter. Baxter has those eyes that tell humans what he's doing, and Baxter has cameras and sensors in his hands and at every joint. And when you want Baxter to learn a new skill, you take his hands and move them through the task. And that's how he learns to do it. And Baxter costs less than a factory worker. That's the capital cost, is less than the annual salary of a factory worker. And he never takes sick leave. He doesn't unionize. He doesn't ask for a raise. Right? There's good and bad here as well. Sensors. The LiDAR in the first Google self-driving car was $70,000. So people said, oh, this will never take off. It'll never be a mass market product. It's just impossibly expensive. Well, now a LiDAR of that quality is about $250. And com consumer LiDAR will be in your phone in the next five years right? for scanning objects and making 3D models to go into virtual reality or to print. Sensors are now so tiny that before long, any object you buy that costs more than, say, $5 might as well have a sensor in it because it's sub-penny cost. They can work off of ambient light and can transmit what's going on. What does that do to your supply chain? Right? What does that do to inventory management? What does that do to our homes? Ericsson thought of, in 2010 that there would be 50 billion connected devices, Internet of Things devices, by 2020, which is an amazing number. It's seven devices for every uh, man, woman, and child alive on Earth, Internet connected. They upped that forecast two years ago to say 500 billion, 70 Internet connected devices for every man, woman, and child. Your wristwatch, your glasses, your pen, your shoes, why not? I've got a fitness tracker here. Shouldn't that be integrated directly into my shoes to give me even more accurate data? And now, more than half of the world's adults are online. And we might have near saturation by 2025. And so your customers are online, your partners are online, your future employees are online. And if your business is not online, you're going to have your lunch eaten by someone who is. Right. But it's not just physical objects. It's not just uh, things eaten by Moore's Law. It's also exponentials in purely physical domains. Solar power, the sun hits us with 10,000 times more energy than we need. And yet, we don't use that much because it was ridiculously expensive just a couple decades ago. But the price of a watt of solar material has plunged by a factor of 200 in the last 40 years, which is something more like digital technology than like buildings or trucks or roads. And so now we have these breakthrough points where in sunny parts of the world, including Australia, solar is just the cheapest energy you can buy. They'd be best illuminated by this uh, graph from Alliance Bernstein, private equity firm in New York. They sent out a memo with this chart a couple years ago showing the cost of oil, coal, and gas on the bottom. And then someone's kid took a crayon, I think, and scrawled across this thing on the right. Now, that's the cost of solar plunging over the long view. That is a disruption in the making. And in fact, again, the, the forecasters have status quo bias. This is a set of forecasts from the IEA, International Energy Agency, on how fast solar would grow. They see you start with 2002 at the bottom. 2004, they said, oops, we were a little bit low. Let's raise it. 2006, they said, oops, we're a little bit low. Raise it. And on and on. I think someone's taking the same Excel macro, I think control C, control V, or something a lot like that. Uh, because the solid blue is what's actually happened. Now, 2014, it looks like the forecasts have gotten pretty good, right? Who thinks the IEA has got it right now? They figured out solar is growing exponentially. So you all know who the butt of my joke is, apparently, because they don't. 
because what's happening is actually it's already lifting away from that line. They project the same solar installs per year to perpetuity when in fact the annual number is going up by 40% per year. That's status quo bias. Or batteries. These things are just as important for our electronics. You all know who this is? Tony Stark? <laughs> Elon is the closest thing we have to Tony Stark, I think. He's using a Tesla Powerwall, and he's able to do this, not because of any single breakthrough, but because batteries, lithium-ion batteries, are also an exponential technology. And they have plunged in price at the same rate as solar. The top line is how fast solar comes down in price. The bottom is how fast batteries come down in price. And that, in addition to changing the energy landscape, uh, changes what our vehicles will be like. How many of you have gotten to drive in a Tesla? A few, good, good. You should all get a ride in a Tesla. They're, they're like spaceships. It's, you get in, and it's like you're in a spacecraft, a giant 21-inch screen that controls everything. When you walk up to a Tesla, the handles sense that you're near, and they pop out of the car for you. It's a beautiful, beautiful experience. Even if it was a gasoline car, it would be. But it also has some things it can do that are unlike any other vehicle on the road. And because it's a computer on wheels, it can do things like software updates. So one day, Tens of thousands of Tesla owners got an email saying, we have a new feature in your car. There was not a recall. They didn't have to buy the next car. They just woke up to an email saying, uh, Elon is not satisfied with how fast the Tesla is. It's already the fastest car on the road. So we've added a new feature called Insane Mode. <laughs> now, I'll show you Insane Mode in a second, but just think about that experience. Every other car manufacturer on Earth would have had you bring the car back in. Tesla just software downloaded the new feature, right? And you just wake up to it. What's that customer experience like? That's amazing. I love this company. It just makes my products better. And two, because it's a computer on wheels and because its drive is all electric and electronic, you can software update the performance of the vehicle, right? Okay, so what is insane mode like? I'm going to show you what insane mode is like. And again, there might be a, a wee bit of profanity in this. I apologize. I'm, I'm really mad that the option is insane. Like, it's not like just. Boy, that's that, perfect. That's, Isn't that good? That's a random, like. That's the future. The car is insane, right? <laughs> Everyone thinks the car is insane, so why not have, you know, like an insane mode, right? Yeah, it makes sense. So you just come to like a complete stop. All right. And then before you know it, you oh shit, Brooks! What the? F <laughs> oh. Seventy miles an hour, Brooks! Oh shit! Yo, first of all, you can't fucking do that to people. Like, you gotta give people a fair warning. Why? Like, you can't fucking just say, "Hey, yeah, Jen, Brooks, what?" I think I shit it in your seat. <laughs> <laughs> so you're gonna go insane? Yeah, I'm not gonna insane. I'm not gonna throw up. I hope not. <laughs> Okay, that's enough. Okay, I got it. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, okay? that's not funny. You, you okay? <laughs> Does it feel like a roller coaster? Oh, man, it did. Yeah, isn't that weird? But there's no, no buildup. No, it just, it just goes. <laughs> when do you do that? All the time. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't drive like that. No, not all the time. Oh my god. I thought it was gonna what's the word? Gradual. Take off? Are you okay? I think so. Okay, so I'll okay. start. So I'll come to a complete stop. <laughs> so totally quiet. And then that's the insane button right there. Oh my god! Oh, oh my god, Brooks! Oh my that's god! 70 miles an hour. Oh, no way! No way! <laughs> Isn't that oh crazy? My God. Basically, right there, that's the sport and insane mode, right? How do you got an insane on the fucking car? Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Who puts an insane mode on the car? So basically, um, you know, you press that button. So you ain't got to worry about it. you stage and stage in the simple car. No, you, you just stage and you go. God, <laughs> damn it, that motherfucker! <laughs> Five miles an hour, right there. <laughs> This is faster than McLaren on the start, ain't it, God? Oh, yeah. Yeah. God. <laughs> I mean, it takes you by surprise, right? What up? You ready? <laughs> so clearly, I get a commission from Tesla every time I give this talk. I wish that was true. Um, 
That, so A, you should all get that. You heard that guy say that's faster than the McLaren at the start. The McLaren is a $500,000 supercar. That's a Tesla Model S, $80,000 vehicle in the US. I think a bit a little pricier here. But so it's still, it's way cheaper, fantastic, but it's still out of reach of most people. But now, because this is an exponential technology, because the battery prices are plunging so fast, that changes. Tesla Model 3 starts shipping next month in July. About uh, half a million people put $1,000 down on this object, sight unseen, to get one. $500 million in free capital for Tesla. And why not? It's a $35,000 vehicle with a 350-kilometer range that accelerates like a Porsche and has self-driving features, right? And so again, complacency bias or status quo bias, uh, the US version of the IEA forecast that red line, there would be 10,000 electric vehicles with a 200 mile range on US roads by 2040, right? And here's what's actually happening. So bet on the innovators and not the forecasters, okay? So the corollary, back to Mark Andreessen, the corollary to software is eating the world is every company will be a software company or you'll be out of business. I'm not saying that's all you'll do. Tesla obviously makes cars, right? But if you are not integrating software deeply into your business, it's game over. Because someone who is will scale farther, will do it more cheaply, will innovate more quickly, and will reach more customers than you can. So in this transition, there's obviously winners and losers. Who pulls it off and who doesn't? So we talked about that digitization, right? We all know the Kodak example, invented digital cameras, went out of business, but it's just dramatic, right? It's not just that Kodak went out of business. Where we take phot photography, where we take photos, changed entirely to these devices. And that has changed the landscape in a way that is quite common actually, because it used to be that the marginal cost of each photo was quite high. Who here took film photos at some point? You had a roll of 24 shots, if you were lucky, and so every shot was, oh my god, I have to get this right. I took 10 photos of my breakfast today, just to, I won't post any of them, probably, and I, hundreds of pictures of Sydney over the last few days, most likely. The marginal cost of each photo is now zero, and that explodes the domain, breakfast photos, where you parked, Instagram, whatever, and that changes the problem domain. The problem domain used to be, how do I get the best shot for each of these 24? The problem domain now is, how do I organize my photos? How do I find them? How do I share them? That changes things dramatically. Who makes the most money on photography today? <coughs> Facebook. I don't know, who said that? Very good, sir. I agree. Some people say Apple. I think it's Facebook. And Facebook doesn't do anything with photography. Even us, leave aside Instagram, who they bought for a billion dollars. Facebook makes no photography products. They don't make a camera. They don't make a photo organizing service. But they make billions off of people's photos. Right? That's a shift in the domain. And you want to be that Facebook. You want to say, oh, look, this domain is just exploding and changing. How can I solve the problem customers don't have yet? Or express the need for them that they don't have? Uh, Clayton Christensen, how many of you have read this book, Innovator's Dilemma? He talks about this common phenomenon in companies, which is a company has an amazing technology, an amazing business model, they're a market leader, and so they become very attached to it. And someone else enters the market, say a digital camera company, enters the market, and the new technology is quite inferior, and it threatens the old business model. You can't sell film anymore. And so every executive in the old company, or every minus one or two, says, oh, we can't, A, that technology sucks, and B, we would lose billions of dollars if we adopted it. Let's just ignore it and hope it never comes to fruition. They don't say it that way. They say it'll never work. And, but then, because it's an exponential technology, eventually it does work. You go from 100 pixel digital photos to 1,000 pixel digital photos to million pixel digital photos to digital photos as good as print, and then why does anyone need your film? Your old business model is gone. It just would have been better if you had been the ones that realized that and created the new business model. And most companies don't. Most don't survive that transition. So dematerialization. Uber, most valuable transport company in the world, owns no vehicles. Airbnb, about to pass. They would have passed Hilton, but there was a merger involved. Airbnb will be the most valuable uh, lodging company in the world, owns no real estate. Right. Lending Club, $5 billion IPO, has no bank branches and doesn't have any deposits either. They're just a marketplace. 
that connects people. For that matter, Facebook doesn't even make content. It manages and connects other people's content. The companies that can scale the facet, fastest have almost no reliance on traditional physical or even financial assets. Demonetization comes next. The number of years it takes to become a billion dollar company and the amount of investment you need has plunged from 20 years on average to one year in the case of Instagram. It's because these companies are all adopting network effects. They're almost all virtual in their products. So that's great if you want to be an entrepreneur or if you want to be an investor and you pick the right ones. But it has challenges also. This is the golden age of news, right? This is the easiest time ever to get high quality news content. We used to get one newspaper. Now we can read news from every perspective on every topic, as broad as you want or as deep as you want. Amazing for consumers and all of it for free, but it's a terrible age for news producers. Right? 50 years of growth wiped out in a decade as digital took over. So how do you adapt to that? How do you uh, get the benefit for consumers but build a business model that works in this new world? It's starting to happen in music. In music, it looked like newspapers. That uh, solid blue, the dark blue, is sales of CDs, records, tapes, and so on. And that has plunged, right? But just in 2014, for the first time, the industry as a whole started growing again when digital music passed uh, physical music for size. But the companies that dominated in physical music are not the ones making the money. They could have been. They tried to slow down this transition instead of embracing it full force. And it's the companies that embrace the new model full force that are the new market leaders. Finally, democratization. You all know uh, this fellow, Gordon Gecko, billionaire you love to hate. Greed is good. This was Gordon Gecko's cell phone. Motorola Dynatac, I think a later speaker today might have a little bit more detail on this, but it cost about $4,000, $5,000 in, in money at that time, about $10,000 or $15,000 today, I think. It had terrible reception. Uh, its charge lasted for 30 minutes of standby time. It took 12 hours to charge up to that. And again, it, it couldn't Snapchat or Angry Birds, had no camera, nothing. So that was Gordon Gecko's uh, device. And now this is the median cell phone user in the world, a poor farmer in Sri Lanka with his $20 Android phone that is thousands of times better than Gordon Gecko's phone. So the capabilities once reserved for the world's governments, for the super wealthy, for militaries, are now in the hands of billions of people around the world. The US has 85% cell phone penetration among adults. Kenya has 87%. Feature phones now, they will be smartphones in the next five years. In India, we anticipate half a billion internet-connected smartphones by the end of next year, right? More than the population of North America or Europe. And other ways we're democratizing data. Language used to be a barrier. Microsoft put translation features for audio into Skype for free. Google has text translation features for free. Whatever content you want to get, you can get for free anywhere around the world. Thomas Friedman said the world is flat, and I think uh, Genevieve will have some things to say about that. It's not exactly flat, but it's flatter than ever before. Your competitors aren't going to come out of the Europe or North America or Australia necessarily. They're going to come from anywhere in the world they happen to be because they can access all of those resources from anywhere in the world. Uh, we talked a bit, we heard a bit about the worry about the destruction of jobs, and that is a good worry to have. The labor landscape will change. But there's also positive things happening on the skills front, say. Uh, this is a little uh, school in the U.S. Anybody know this school? MIT. Little school, you might have heard of it. MIT has committed to putting 100% of their curriculum online for free over the next few years. Now, that's a bold move. Somebody there said, let's do this crazy thing. It will probably be to their benefit. It'll increase the power of their brand. It'll make it even more interesting to actually go to MIT. But it also democratizes access to this information. So now you can imagine people anywhere with a smart AI tutor. Another democratization. Information asymmetry has long been to the advantage of those that hold the information. But now with simple smartphone tools, we can detect someone's pulse by looking at their face. We can detect eye shifts. We can tell if someone is lying by pointing a cell phone camera at them and running cheap algorithms. What does that do to your marketing team? 
Hopefully good things. Winners and losers. So how do you optimize for being a winner? Well, one thing to realize is that we are change averse. We like to think of ourselves as innovators, as aggressive, as pursuing the new changes, but our brains are wired to worry that the rustling in the bushes is a tiger. Right? And even if that was just the wind, nine times out of 10, if you jumped, you had a chance to survive. And our organizations, even more so, we are used to tribes of 70 people uh, where nothing changes in technology over our entire lifetime. But instead, now we have this global, interconnected, 7 billion person situation. And our organizations, top down, run, and so on, are built for a different era and a different brain architecture as well. And we see that. Almost 90% of the Fortune 500 from the 1950s is gone. Right? The average lifespan of a company in the S&P 500 has dropped by a factor of four over the last century. Change comes faster, and organizations are not, today, built to adapt. So how do you structure your organization to adapt more quickly? I recommend two more books. One is uh, my friends Andy McAfee and Eric Winolfson. This comes out in about a month machine platform crowd. They talk about leveraging algorithms, making your product into a platform, and leveraging people outside of your organization. Next book is one by my good friend Salim Ishmael, a fellow person at Singularity University. And Shalim's book, Exponential Organizations, talks about having a massive transformative purpose for your company, first and foremost, and then two sets of things. On the left, ideas. It's really about being a more bottoms up and innovative organization inside your company, and to scale, more leveraging resources outside of your organization as force multipliers for you. I recommend this highly. I will try to synthesize those in just four points that I call PACE, which is that the successful companies we see build platforms, networks, they embrace autonomy for their employees, they leverage the crowd, and they have a high degree of experimentation internally and a willingness to try things and fail. Two of these go together, platform and crowd, and the other two, autonomy and experimentation, are heavily interlinked. So what does platform mean? We use this word platform a lot. So here's one of the, the seminal platforms, Microsoft Windows. Right? What makes this a platform? It's that there's a virtuous cycle where every new customer who used Windows made Windows more attractive for developers to build their programs to run on Windows. And then every program that ran on Windows made Windows more attractive for every new customer to buy that copy of Windows. It's a virtuous cycle where partners and customers are each making the product more attractive to others. And you might not notice it, but the companies we were just talking about are the same way. With Airbnb, every new listing of a room makes it more attractive for people who want a place to stay to shop there. Every new customer using Airbnb to find a place to stay makes it more attractive to list your property there. With Uber, more geographic density makes the wait times shorter, makes the app more attractive, more customers calling for rides, makes it the place the drivers want to be. With Facebook, every person using Facebook makes Facebook more useful for more people by sharing those pictures and memories and so on. It's Metcalfe's law. The value of a network is equal to the square of the number of people on it. Double the number of users and you quadruple the value of your network or your platform. And that relates a bit to crowd. Even if you don't have that virtuous cycle, you still face the problem that the smartest people in the world, the most talented people, don't all work for you. If you're lucky, a few of them do, but they don't all. And so how can you leverage people outside of your organization? Well, here's one example. Something called Kaggle was founded around this. How many of you are data scientists? How many of you employ data scientists? How many of you think you're the best data scientists in the world? Kaggle is a marketplace for data scientists. You and Google actually recently acquired Kaggle just a few months ago. You go to Kaggle, you say, here's my problem, here's the outcome I want, here's the data set I want, and then data sci and here's a prize I'm offering. And data scientists go after that prize. And in doing this, Allstate nearly tripled the predictive uh, quality of one of their algorithms for claims without employing a data scientist on this themselves and with a prize of $10,000 for something worth millions and millions in ROI to them. OK, that's platform and crowd. Autonomy. 
We heard earlier today about the need to inspire employees to think bigger and to use their creativity and to use their brains. And that is something that companies often stifle. Here's an example of stifling that at the sort of unit level. Anyone remember this, this product? Windows CE, Windows Phone. A decade ago, before the iPhone existed, Microsoft had Windows running on phones, all the same features you'd have in an iPhone, right? But this UI is horrible. This is terrible. Why would you want a start menu on your phone? Well, as a customer, you don't. Why did Microsoft want a start menu on the phone? Brand. So Microsoft strategically told this team not to go make the best thing for consumers, but to make something that fit in with the rest of its strategy. I understand that instinct. That's what corporations do. But it resulted in a suboptimal user experience that never took off. Apple worked differently. Steve Jobs could have told the iPhone team, use the Macintosh, I have a finder on there, make it look and feel like the Mac. He didn't. He gave them autonomy. He said, disrupt the phone business. He said, go do the best thing you possibly can for customers and build a good business. Don't listen to anyone else in the company. You're protected from them. Uh, this is a company in Seattle, Valve Software, they make games. And Valve is an amazing company. People literally take their desks, roll them over to the other team they want to work with, plug in and work with them. No one tells them what to work on. They do know what's happening in the company, what's happening strategically. And Valve makes more money per employee than Microsoft or Google. They had a hit game called, uh, now I forget the name of the game, but a hit game that people wanted a sequel to. And the employees were not excited about doing it. Instead, they built this. They built Steam, which is now the leading platform for virtual reality experiences that worked with HTC Vive. And finally, experimentation. If you want new ideas in your company, you have to let people try things, try wild and crazy things, knowing that most of them will fail. And you have to reward not just success, but reward a good effort and reward something that produces learning. The, and this often goes hand in hand with autonomy. And the most successful companies in this, like Google or Amazon, use it pervasively. When you go to Amazon.com, you are part of dozens of experiments where employees, often without having to check with their manager, have said, I have a new algorithm. I think it can improve the performance of this feature or it can increase the ROI for this customer. I'm just going to run it in an experiment. And what wins, what determines what's on the page finally, is not what a manager thinks, but what the data from those experiments has said. And again, most of these experiments fail. It's not that 9 out of 10 fail. It's 99 out of 100 fail to move the bar. But this is the way, ultimately, that they improve the quality of their product. It's the Darwinian method, if you will, the scientific method towards new product innovations. Now, for large companies, it's hard to change a company wholesale in this way, but you can do what Steve Jobs did. He didn't uh, challenge the Macintosh team to change overnight, but he did tell the iPod team, you are autonomous, you are independent, go disrupt music. Don't listen to the Macintosh team. You're in a separate building, you report only to me. He did say that to the iPhone team as well, and that's why we have the multi-billion dollar business that we have. So those four things, pace. Platform, autonomy, crowd, and experimentation. In the final analysis, there's technology out there that enables your competitors to try to disrupt you, and they're not going to ask your permission. Right? So the only way to respond is for you to disrupt yourself. And I'll close with the words of Charles Darwin, so that it's not the strongest of the species that survives, or even the smartest, but it's the one that's most adaptive to change. And I think that you can be that. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Nice. So we take a seat. Yeah. Okay. Want to take a seat? Sure. Why don't you take that? Thanks. Fantastic presentation, Ramesh. Thank um, you. It was great to hear about pace and the and the four Ds. Just in the interest of time, we we might go straight to questions and answers. Um, and to get the ball rolling, a question for you, of course. Um, you're a futurist at heart um, and the occasional writer of science fiction. I want you to close your eyes and think about a day in the life of yourself in 20 years' time. What do you do in a day? How do you go about it? What does the machine and AI do for you? Describe it out to the audience, please. 
I think the key about what's going to happen for all of us is that routine tasks will just go by the wayside as much as we, we can. In the US, we see very clearly that if you separate employment into the routine versus the non-routine, whether it's physical or intellectual, the routine stuff is flatlined, but the non-routine is going up. That means that doing the same work in a similar spreadsheet again and again is just not going to be work fit for humans. It's not something that humans excel at. But innovating and what's the new model we're going to use? How can I merge model A and model B? Having high level judgment and creativity, that is where humans excel and what we'll be doing. Fantastic. I might turn to the audience. Are there any questions from the audience? We have a roving microphone. And none online from Zetings, I don't think. With I that in mind. Answer them all. You've answered them all. You've got exactly. a question at the back. So we've got a question at the back. Thank you. Could you just so, state your name and, and where sure. you're from, please? I'm, I'm Michael Schrake from, from MIT. Lovely photo, by the way. Thanks, Michael. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to ask the question because this is a corporation here. When you give this talk and describe pace, what resistance to the pace message do you get from large organizations all over the world? Yeah, great question. People don't say that they're resistant. But when push comes to shove, when you have a multi-dollar business, multi-billion dollar business, and you see an innovator coming that might disrupt that business, people still have a, a gut reaction that's like, no, that's not going to happen. And no, I can't let go of this huge revenue stream. And uh, there's sort of a political thing that happens. You have, a, you have some large corporation, and you have an executive, a group vice president, that owns this multi-billion dollar business. And the CEO says, let's spin up a new business that's going to disrupt the old business. You have bad behavior. You have big company behavior where the current owner of that revenue stream is going to subtly or not so subtly try to impede the progress of the new business that might disrupt them. That's the most common thing that I see in, in big organizations, unfortunately. Fair. And it takes strong leadership from the top. I and mean, I talk about building a bottoms up organization, but it takes strong leadership from the top to say, no, this new organization does not have to check with you on anything. They don't have to listen to you. There's no committee meetings with you. They're just empowered to go, go, go. I set their budget. They report to me, not to you. And that's a, a strange thing to hear, and it sounds sort of harsh, but you have to protect the new disruptive thing. Otherwise, it will get uh, killed by the corporate immune system. Another question here in the middle. We'll just take one more. Uh, hi. Um, uh, Penny Gale from the RIA in South Australia, which is the equivalent of the RIA, uh, NRMA here. Uh, you talked about a lot of jobs disappearing. Um, and you talked about what other people will be doing. Will there be enough new jobs for all the people who want to work? Or what do you think that in 20, 30 years' time people will be doing? Uh, thank you, Penny. It's a great question. And I think we just have to be honest and say we don't know. Like that's a, an incredibly... Uh, modest thing to say, but it's the reality. Like We cannot predict what will happen there. We know that in the past, we made the transition from being agrarian to having a modern economy. Many of us have jobs that people 100 years ago could not even understand what they are, and it worked out. It's lifted prosperity for all of us. But there may have been times, it's hard to tell from the data, during the Industrial Revolution that jobs really plunged and wages plunged uh, for a decade or two decades. That's a very long period of time. So I worry about two different things. At the, at the macro scale, will there be enough jobs? I'm less worried about that. I don't have data that says for sure, but I'm more confident that we'll invent these new jobs and move into them. But then there's the more micro scale. For truck drivers, what will happen to them? For, in the, for specific job sectors, I think we will undoubtedly see disruption. And it behooves us as a society to think about how can we retrain those people as rapidly as possible for new jobs and how do we build a safety net that encourages them to learn while keeping them afloat and in good dignity while that happens. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your time here at Amplify Remez. All the best uh, for the remainder of your week in Sydney. I know you're joining us at a number of other functions. For visitors to AMP and Amplify today, thank you very much for your contribution. Thank, Thank you, you very much.